Kia ora tato and no mai haida mai to our Goodfellow webinar on eating disorders in children and adolescents. My name is Katie McCulloch and I'm a nurse practitioner who works for the Goodfellow unit and for primary health care in South Auckland. Tonight we're going to be hearing from Dr. Raywin Gavin, who is a general paediatrician at Starship Children's Hospital. And she has a special interest in the medical aspects of eating disorders, including acute medical instability and also the long-term impact on reproductive bone and brain health. And this webinar is supported by Farauro. I'm now going to hand over to Raven. Thank you, Katie. Um, and thank you all for coming along. Um, so uh, I was asked to uh, talk about medical issues uh, in eating disorders, uh, specifically those uh, affecting children and adolescents. Um, and so what I want to go over uh, this evening um, is a little bit about uh, medical risk and medical complications, how to think about weight and BMI in children, uh, issues which might affect athletes and young people with diabetes, a little bit about uh, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is otherwise known as ARFID, something about uh, the effect of COVID on the incidence of eating disorder, so that might relate to your next webinar. Um, and then I've got two sort of brief uh, case scenarios that we could look at and some time at the end for questions. So this is, um, many of you I know working in general practice will have noticed an increasing uh, trend of uh, people presenting with eating disorders. And these are our uh, admission figures for the Starship. And um, since we started our inpatient eating disorder service back in 2008, uh, and we have had a, a, a steady year-on-year -year increase. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, and this year is looking like an even bigger increase again. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. And that's a trend that's been seen uh, internationally also. So one of the things uh, that we think about in the Starship uh, is how uh, children with eating disorders differ to adults with eating disorders. Uh, and these are some of the main differences. The uh, most important uh, of which is that young people are at a much higher risk of rapid medical deterioration. Um, you may uh, well have patients yourself or, or see adults around who are extremely thin and seem to manage to um, have not much in the way of acute medical risk, but young people whose physiology is different are at a much higher risk of becoming unstable quickly. In addition to that, there's a significant risk of potentially irreversible effects on their long-term physical and emotional development. So eating disorders in young people often occurs around a time of puberty, a time when they are um, developing uh, their adult bones and their uh, reproductive health and their height growth. In addition to this, when you talk to adults who are involved in eating disorders, they will often tell you what the BMI is as a number, but in young people, BMI can be uh, less useful. It can be normal and the normal range for BMIs change with age. Uh, having said that, it sounds a bit uh, doom and gloom, but in fact, the, um, the prognosis for young people is uh, significantly better than, than adults with eating disorders, unless there's a very early age of onset. So um, one of the things I want to talk about first <coughs> is medical risk. Uh, and um, our guidelines for management of uh, inpatient management of young people with eating disorders is easily accessible to anybody on the Starship website. And I know uh, other people around the country have similar guidelines. So admission criteria may not be the same in every hospital, um, but they're probably roughly similar. Uh, so one of the things that uh, you, a primary care practitioners, 
will often need to think about is, do I need to send this person to hospital? Um, and it's often useful when you're talking to families to know a little bit about what the goals of admission to hospital are. So uh, at the Starship, uh, we have a number of different criteria for admission. So one is about uh, the amount and the rate of weight loss. So, so more than 15 to 20% of body weight lost over three months, regardless of what the starting weight was, um, or having a body weight that's less than 75% of what you would expect for age and height. And that's where the BMI centile charts come in very handy. Any evidence of acute medical complication, and the commonest one we see is uh, syncope, um, uh, much less likely to have seizures or heart failure. Uh, fasting hypoglycemia is, is very concerning, uh, and abnormal potassium and phosphate uh, would also be indications for admission. Uh, changes on the ECG, including uh, abnormal rhythm or prolonged QT interval. Uh, but the commonest reason that we uh, uh, have children referred to hospital is um, bradycardia uh, or hypotension, um, as well as postural changes uh, and low body temperature. Uh, so those cutoff uh, criteria are slightly different to adults. Um, we tend to have a, a higher cutoff because of um, young age. The norms for heart rate and blood pressure tend to be a little bit lower anyway sorry, higher anyway. Um, and these criteria are all available on the Starship website. We uh, also have other criteria for a review in hospital, but not necessarily admission. So if young people have refused to eat anything for 48 hours, we would um, review them. Uh, uh, and if they've refused food and fluids for more than 24 hours, uh, or they're significantly dehydrated. Again, that would warrant a, a thorough review. Uh, if young people are already in outpatient therapy and uh, as much as possible is being done, but they're still deteriorating, we may consider admission. And we also take into account other significant comorbidities. So they might be medical, such as the patients with diabetes or acute psychiatric um, distress or conditions. So when we're thinking about uh, admitting young people to hospital, the, the number one goal of admission is to stabilise the young person and uh, keep them safe. Uh, every now and then we have to use uh, the Mental Health Act to force young people to stay in hospital if we think they're at immediate risk, uh, risk of um, severe illness or death, uh, but we don't have to do that very often. Um, once they're stabilised, we, our aim is to re-establish regular eating and support the parents uh, and provide some initial education for the parents because it's the parents who are going to be doing most of this management at home after the young person's discharged. Um, and we know that early intervention is associated with better outcomes, both physically and psychologically. So most people who come into hospital, our average length of stay is about 14 days. Uh, so initially it's very closely monitoring, uh, lots of bed rest, regular blood tests, then a pattern of re-establishing meals, then practicing that at home uh, on leave and then discharge. So what happens after discharge? After discharge, ideally up until about 18 months ago, they would transition seamlessly from hospital into outpatient therapy uh, without a delay. And most young people stay in outpatient therapy for between one and two years. Uh, the gold standard outpatient therapy provided is family-based therapy that has the best evidence base. Um, and that is a therapy where the parents are basically managing uh, the young person's eating, uh, through a number of steps with increasing independence giving back to the young person as they improve. Obviously, family-based therapy can be quite difficult if you're living in a, a single parent family or a dysfunctional family. 
And so there are other therapies which can also be helpful, such as um, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBTE, which is specifically designed for eating disorder, or adolescent focused therapy, which is more of an individualized therapy aimed at adolescents. In addition to outpatient therapy, some young people also need to be started on medication. Uh, we don't usually start this very acutely because um, a lot of people who are malnourished for a number of different reasons will have uh, anxiety and depression. So we wait to see if restoring nutrition will help those symptoms. But uh, particularly for those with significant pre-existing anxiety or depression, we might start some medication uh, for that if it is thought to um, be helpful for their recovery. So we'll move now on to talking about the um, medical complications of eating disorders. Uh, so we divided these into short-term and long-term. The short-term ones that we are worried about most uh, during the hospital stay are refeeding syndrome. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Effects on the heart, kidneys, bone marrow, and gut. And in the longer term, effect on bone health, fertility, and brain function. So uh, I'm sure you've all heard about refeeding syndrome. Refeeding syndrome was something which was uh, learned about uh, when uh, rescuing prisoners of war um, from prison camps. And a lot of people would uh, do what, what they thought was the right thing and uh, give these uh, uh, very malnourished people lots of food to eat. And some of them would have uh, developed refeeding syndrome, which uh, can be fatal. Um, fortunately for us, our young people usually present before they are at such an extreme state of malnutrition. And also some of the prisoners of war also had other uh, medical conditions and skin sepsis and gut parasites and all sorts of things, complicating things. So when the syndrome was first discovered, people uh, got very worried about refeeding too quickly and started increasing feeds very, very slowly. Um, so there, there was also another condition um, which occurred in lots of hospitals, which is underfeeding syndrome. So um, you don't want to do that either. But we know a lot about refeeding syndrome now. And uh, what happens when you're starving is you are not taking in as much carbohydrate. So your insulin secretion is reduced and you're getting your energy from breakdown of fat and protein. Uh, and this causes a change in your electrolyte balance. Um, so your intracellular phosphate uh, is reduced, but your serum phosphate is maintained. So you can have a total body uh, shortage of phosphate despite having a normal circulating phosphate. Um, then when you start feeding people again and the body shifts from, cat to, from fat to carbohydrate metabolism, your pancreas starts making more insulin, um, phosphate gets taken up into the cells out of the serum and that can cause a rapid drop in the serum phosphate. And phosphate is the key thing, um, uh, the key element involved in refeeding syndrome. Uh, I don't know what you were like, but when I was learning about Krebs cycle, it all just looked like a foreign language to me, but it's this little bit down the bottom here, that little P there is the phosphate that's so important. Um, and that little part of the cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, is where, where the phosphate uh, comes in so importantly. Uh, so the early signs of refeeding syndrome are often quite subtle, so we monitor them very closely in hospital with daily blood tests. Um, and we start at about 75% um, of usual maintenance calorie intake. And we watch their serum phosphate, magnesium, potassium, and glucose. Uh, and usually refeeding syndrome occurs within the first four to seven days of refeeding. Um, and in primary care, uh, sometimes you will see somebody who you're concerned about an eating disorder, and you might have a talk to the family, and the family might be very keen to try and manage it at home, which is great. But it is important just to be aware of the risk of refeeding syndrome. So if you think anybody's going to try that and have good success with refeeding, 
then they all need to be um, given some uh, supplementary phosphate. Um, so it's phosphate febra, used to be phosphate sandals, one tablet twice daily for two weeks will restore their body's um, phosphate stores. Um, and when we're doing that, we very rarely see any um, symptomatic refeeding syndrome. If we're worried that the phosphate's dropping while the feeds are being reintroduced, we'll just slow down the increase in calories. Um, so uh, kidney function is probably one of the other most common uh, issues that we see early on in a, in a hospital admission. So some young people, um, it's interesting, there's, there's different ways people can go in terms of their fluid intake. Some young people we see will drink lots and lots of water to try and uh, help with the feelings of hunger, but also to try and make their weight look more than it is. Um, but other young people are so distressed about anything passing their lips, they won't even uh, drink uh, water. Um, and they can obviously become quick quite quickly with an acute kin kidney injury. Um, and there's an increased risk of um, kidney stones. Uh, when they're recovering from their acute kidney injury, they sometimes get polyuria, and that can take a little while to settle sometimes. But the kidney injuries usually uh, improve fairly quickly with improved nutrition. The other uh, important thing to know about if you're looking at kidney function by measuring creatinine, if you're extremely underweight um, with a low body mass, you'd expect your kidney, uh, your creatinine to be slightly lower than average anyway. So some, some people with a uh, creatinine, which is not highlighted in red, but is at the upper end of the normal range, may also um, have some kidney impairment. And for people who are exercising vigorously, um, exercising vigorously without adequate nutrition can cause muscle breakdown, which can make your creatinine go up too. Uh, we very uh, extremely commonly in, in our hospital population, probably about 50% of our patients have uh, neutropenia uh, and anemia and thrombocytopenia um, to a lesser extent and this is due to bone marrow uh, atrophy um, and the bone marrow uh, tissue gets uh, replaced with gelatinous material and that, that can happen with malnutrition from any cause it's not just eating disorders. As I said earlier bradycardia is the probably the commonest indication for admission to hospital um, and it usually improves fairly quickly. Um, we also sometimes see young people with um, arrhythmias, and these are most commonly due to uh, abnormalities in potassium and calcium, and they're more common in young people who are purging. Uh, prolonged QT interval is very important to check for on the ECG. Um, both as a risk factor for arrhythmia in itself, but also if you have a prolonged QT interval and purging, and you may be on uh, some psychiatric medication which impacts your QT interval, it can be a bit of a dangerous combination. Uh, now, obviously, your heart is made of muscle, and your heart size can actually change, and the shape can change. And some young people will develop mitral valve prolapse as their heart shape changes. Uh, and this is just an example of a chest X-ray of um, a young woman with an eating disorder who um, had a, a very low cardiothoracic ratio, just showing how, how very small her heart is. Gut complications are very common. Uh, constipation is um, almost universal, and that relates to uh, reduced gut transit time secondary to malnutrition. We tend to treat that uh, early um, because the discomfort from uh, a combination of constipation and delayed gastric emptying can make these young people very uncomfortable after meals and put them off eating more. Um, <clears throat> we uh, Obviously, we have to be a little bit aware of a potential for laxative abuse, but that's um, less common in young people than it is in adults. And if we, uh, we can usually get young people off laxatives before discharge. Uh, and if we can't, we ask the parents to uh, monitor laxative use and um, try and wean it off fairly quickly. 
Um, some of our young people get transiently uh, abnormal liver function. It usually re recovers very quickly. And gallstones and pancreatitis are much less common in young people than in adults with eating disorders. Um, one of the things we talk about really carefully, particularly to parents of young people with eating disorders, because uh, the young people tend not to be thinking about what their bones are going to be like when they're age 50 or 60. Um, but there is a really significant risk of uh, early onset osteoporosis uh, in young people who have a prolonged period of malnutrition during adolescence. Um, uh, adolescence is a really important time of your life for uh, bone development and about a third of your adult bone mass is achieved during puberty. So the longer recovery takes, the higher the risk of osteoporosis. And about a third of patients will have osteopenia more than 10 years later, even if they make a full recovery. Um, so we try and get a, a baseline bone density scan on, on most of the young people who come uh, through our service as inpatients. This is a bone density scan on a, a, of a 16 year old um, who had a Z score of minus 2.9, so already in the osteoporosis range at 16 years of age. Um, the other really important thing about being young is that up until about 18 or 20 years of age, you do have the possibility of improving your bone density and catching it up. Whereas if it's much later than that, you can maintain your bone density where it is, uh, but not get the catch up. So that's, um, that's quite a good motivator for some people, particularly uh, some of the athletes are, are pretty keen to preserve their bone density. Uh, so the best treatment of low bone density in these young people is improving their nutrition and getting their weight back up, particularly their body fat. Um, it's really important to check vitamin D as well. Uh, some, uh, some of our young people have very significant low vitamin D, uh, particularly the um, Asian patients. Um, and if they're not... Uh, very active or athletic before they became unwell with an eating disorder that also increases their risk of osteoporosis. Um, occasionally, um, if recovery is very prolonged and they're not making good progress, sometimes uh, we talk to the endocrinologists about estrogen patches or taking supplementary estrogen, but the long-term uh, data on bone health um, in young people who are taking hormone supplements but haven't recovered their body weight uh, is not nearly as good as making uh, nutritional uh, restoration. Um, other complications uh, effect on reproductive development. So uh, delayed onset of periods is very common. Uh, and it's, it's quite tricky if you have somebody who comes into hospital lose 14 who hasn't started their periods and you have to figure out whether they uh, haven't started their periods because of their low body weight or uh, they haven't started their periods because they're constitutionally going to have periods later and often there's a family history of that so we can get a hand x-ray for a bone age which will tell us about that and if your bone age is uh, equivalent to a 13 year old, then you should usually be having your periods if your health is otherwise normal. Um, so most of the young people we have who have already started their periods, uh, their periods have stopped by the, by the time they come into hospital. And of those about 20% will never get their periods back regularly. Um, there's also a risk, even if they uh, do make a good recovery of uh, in increased chance of complications of pregnancy and reduced response to fertility treatment. Um, uh, other insula, other uh, endocrinological problems, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about blood sugar later. Um, most of these young people will have a reduced T3 thyroid function uh, and some who are very unwell will have a reduced T4 thyroid function as well. Obviously, it's important to check thyroid function 
because uh, some young people presenting with uh, thyroid disease can present with weight loss or bradycardia or low body temperature as well. Uh, so that's quite a good marker of recovery when the T3, the T3 tends to recover before the estrogen starts to go up. Um, the other thing, I'm sure all of you who have looked after patients with eating disorders will notice a significant change in um, brain function. Uh, often they uh, needing to spend a lot, lot more time on their schoolwork, um, having problems with short-term memory and focus and attention, but also a very significant change and personality and a loss of sense of humour. Um, and obviously, as you know, that happens uh, in people with malnutrition or acute weight loss from other causes as well. Uh, but it's very distressing for parents. Uh, and there's a very high incidence, as we mentioned briefly before, of depression and anxiety, some of which is transient and secondary to weight loss and some of which may be longer term. Uh, so hypoglycemia, really important thing, I think, particularly for um, uh, people in general practice who may be monitoring blood tests in young people with eating disorders, is that um, it's very common, particularly as people recover from an eating disorder, to get a mild asymptomatic postprandial hypoglycemia. Uh, and that is thought to be due to dysregulated insulin release. So you have a meal and your pancreas gets a bit overexcited and the insulin release goes on a bit longer. Um, and usually if it's mild, there's no symptoms and the blood test was done after a meal, the only thing you need to do is repeat a blood test before a meal and it's usually normal. Seems a bit counterintuitive. Um, what we do really worry about is fasting hypoglycemia because uh, basically if you can't maintain your blood sugar when you're not eating, it means that you have no uh, available glycogen stores, which needs very urgent attention. Um, <clears throat> some of those other things are, um, are signs that you might look out for. Uh, Lanugo hair on the body, so fine downy hair on the body, uh, which grows in um, response to low body temperature. Hair loss from the head, which is uh, reducing the non-essential use of protein, often very dry skin, and the, and the parotid and dental signs of uh, recurrent purging, which again is, is more common in, in older patients. So what about the out, outlook for, uh, this is about anorexia nervosa in particular, but if you look at all age patients with anorexia nervosa, the average duration of illness is five to six years. Uh, and for some adults, it's a lot longer than that. Uh, but in adolescents who are receiving therapy, it tends to be much, much shorter, one to two years, which still, if you're 14, it sounds like quite a long time. Um, but um, up to 80% of adolescents will make a full recovery. Um, and, and the majority of those who don't make a full recovery still are able to... Um, work and attend school. Um, and there's a small little, um, probably 5% of patients will go on to develop what we call severe and enduring eating disorders, which have a, a drastically uh, worse prognosis. The really important thing to remember about eating disorders uh, is it, do, is it does have a significant mortality. It has the highest mortality of all psychiatric disorders in young people. Uh, and has a higher mortality uh, than acute lymphoblastic leukemia in the paediatric age group. Um, and that shocks a lot of people. Um, so uh, of the uh, mortality, about half is from medical complications, which is usually sudden cardiac death, and about half is from suicide. Um, there's a very significantly increased suicide risk and um, about a quarter of patients will make at least one suicide attempt. The sudden cardiac death is uh, very scary because the patients can look reasonably well and then uh, suddenly have an acute cardiac event. Um,
So uh, the things that will increase your risk uh, is that if you're losing weight very quickly, if you've lost a large amount of weight over a short amount of time, if your body weight uh, or BMI is very low. Um, so, so a lower BMI does usually mean more risk, but you can also have significant risk at a normal BMI if you've had a rapid weight loss. The other thing that's really important to think about in children is that um, uh, low uh, undernutrition during their uh, adolescent years can impact their height growth. So you can have somebody who isn't losing weight at all. Their weight is just stable, but because their height is continuing to go up and their weight is staying static, their BMI ends up decreasing. Uh, so that's why we talk about BMI centile charts, and these are, are, are really available on the internet. Um, and you'll see that if you're a seven-year-old and you've got a BMI of 16, you're doing pretty well. But if you're a 15-year-old with a BMI of 16, you'd be pretty worried. Um, so everything is relative to age. So here are a couple of interesting examples of uh, weight trajectory in patients that we have had through uh, uh, through our program. So one was a 14-year-old Samoan young woman. Uh, her weight was on the 50th centile. Her height was on the 50th centile. Her BMI was just slightly above average. Um, so you probably wouldn't even think about the possibility of an eating disorder uh, unless you looked at her uh, growth patterns over time. So she had come from a very high weight, well above the 99th centile. She'd actually, as a 12-year-old, had uh, surgery on the orthopedic ward for slipped upper femoral epiphysis and had been advised very strongly by uh, the orthopedic surgeons that she needed to lose weight, which she uh, did. And she uh, became very sporty and uh, became medically unstable and was admitted to hospital uh, with an eating disorder, but made a, a very good recovery. Uh, this is another young person weight, she's only nine, weight on the, on the 50th centile. Uh, and her mother was worried about her eating. Um, she wasn't worried about her losing weight, but uh, her daughter would only eat things that were white. Um, and this included ice cream, yogurt, uh, a type of vanilla sponge. Um, so not particularly low calorie things. So if you looked at her weight pattern over time, she had previously been on the upper centile lines and her rate of weight increase had started to slow down, still actually going up slightly, but uh, not, not on the same centile line as before. At the same time, her height here had continued to track up along the, the 90th centile, and that meant that her BMI was gradually going down and down. So they're just a couple of examples um, of patients who, uh, if you just looked at their initial weight, uh, you probably wouldn't be too concerned. Uh, so now we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, athletes. Um, increasingly over the um, previous decade or two, we see uh, young, younger and younger people becoming very competitive in sports. Um, and we know that eating disorders in athletes are, uh, um, quite prevalent, uh, in particular sports that have uh, certain weight classes um, or sports that are uh, what are called aesthetic sports. So sports where, you know, like ice, ice skating and gymnastics and dance, uh, where your body appearance uh, is um, valued. Uh, and then there are other sports where a low BMI is seen to be advantageous, such as rock climbing, uh, long distance running uh, and cycling. So there was a big review in Norway of elite athletes and they found that um, when they looked at uh, the control group, so people who weren't elite athletes, the prevalence of eating disorders was about 4.6% compared to 13.5% of athletes. And if they just looked at females, it was 20% of female athletes. And if you looked at females in the aesthetic sports, uh, it was nearly half of them uh, met diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder. Uh, so it's very uh, common. So it's really important to always ask about periods. Um, 
it's really easy to, um, to not think about periods in patients with uh, uh, primary amenorrhea, so they've never had a period. Uh, but often these young um, women can have very low body fat um, and their BMI can be falsely reassuring. But if all of your weight is muscle and none of it is fat, then you won't make um, estrogen. Um, and both athletes and eating disorder patients can have an increased risk of sudden cardiac death. Uh, and when you look at the um, studies looking at athletes, and an athlete is defined as somebody who does regular uh, long-term intensive exercise for more than four hours per week. And when you look at some of these uh, high school students uh, training schedules, that uh, would not be unusual at all. Um, I don't know if anybody, I'll give you a minute to have a look at this uh, ECG and see if anybody can uh, make a comment on what might be wrong with it. Sinus bradycardia, I guess that's what SB means. Uh, yep, got that. Yep, so apart from bradycardia, the other thing that's um, interesting to note here is the P waves. So you've got a P wave here, and this complex is a P wave in there, and then it's there. Not quite sure where it is there, then it's there. So, the, so um, this is a, a junctional um, rhythm, which is very commonly seen in athletes, where the rate of, of the P wave is different to the rate of the QRS, and it's associated with particularly significant um, bradycardia. Um, So uh, the good thing is that I think people are starting to become more aware of um, nutrition and its impact on, um, on young uh, athletes. Um, and there was, a, there was quite a few articles in the media around the time of the Olympics about, about nutrition um, and how poor nutrition does not uh, improve your performance. Uh, and a lot of people talk about this condition called relative energy deficiency in sport. And there's some quite good, sensible uh, information around uh, for young people that it's probably worth talking about. And may, maybe if you talk about that early on, it might um, prevent some people progressing into an eating disorder. Uh, we've certainly had, not so much recently, but a few years ago, we used to have some quite... Um, for me anyway, like shocking comments made to young people about their uh, weight and nutrition sports coaches um, often. Uh, the other thing that we're increasing, uh, increasingly aware of is uh, the risk of eating disorders in young people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, about a third of them have some sort of disordered eating. And you can imagine if you're a teenager who's always having to read the labels on everything that you eat. Um, that read, you know, reading food labels a lot in itself is a risk factor, uh, but you, you're always being uh, talked about your um, diet and you get weighed when you come to clinic. And it's very easy for young people with diabetes to underdose their insulin and that will make their weight go down. It's obviously not a good thing for their long-term um, complications of diabetes. Um, and they can be quite challenging to manage if they develop a really severe eating disorder. Uh, we've also noticed quite a few patients uh, diagnosed with celiac disease, which has less of the um, acute risk of diabetes, but it's also a disorder uh, where people are reading food labels a lot and thinking really carefully about what they eat all the time. So the the other thing I just wanted to touch briefly on is the changing demographics in young people with eating disorders. Um, and I think somebody was asking in the chat about, about males with eating disorders. So classically you used to think of um, upper middle class, white women uh, or girls developing eating disorders. Uh, but there is definitely an increasing trend in males, about 10 to 15% of, of our total. They, they may be less likely to be diagnosed and some of them will have uh, more of a, less of a weight loss focus and more of an increasing muscle definition focus. 
We're also seeing quite a few patients uh, with gender dysphoria and transgender patients uh, presenting with eating disorders, particularly transgender males, so that's biological females who identify as male, who find it extremely distressing when they start to develop breasts uh, and start their periods and by uh, losing weight and maintaining a very low body weight they can manage some of that dysphoria. We're all seeing, also seeing increasing um, incidence in Maori and Pacific patients and uh, ethnic minorities and people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, it, it can happen to anybody. Um, we also, uh, a lot of our patients with ARFID, which I'll come on to in a moment, uh, have comorbid autism uh, and very rigid uh, eating habits, lots of uh, sensory issues relating to their food choices, which can also be pretty challenging. So um, ARFID is uh, short for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. And it's defined as uh, the failure to meet nutritional needs associated with uh, weight loss or failure to gain weight, a significant nutritional deficiency, um, such that you're dependent on other ways of getting uh, nutrition in and having a marked interference on your psychosocial functioning. Uh, and it can't be due to a lack of available food. They don't have body image distortion. It's not attributable to a concurrent medical uh, or other mental disorder. So we've had some pretty extreme examples of this, um, including people who have had symptomatic uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, scurvy, uh, all sorts of um, you know, people needing to be sedated at home and brought to hospital with police escort in order to, um, to get uh, uh, life-saving nutrition uh, because of severe food restriction. Uh, so, so people with ARFID are not necessarily less severe than people with anorexia nervosa. They're probably much more common. It's more common in males uh, and often uh, occurs at a younger age. We've got a seven-year-old on the ward at the moment um, with this who has a background history of fairly mild autism, but then de developed um, a very severe restrictive eating pattern. Um, so, yeah, autism is uh, probably the, the commonest link with ARFID. So somebody asked earlier about uh, COVID. So yes, we've seen a, a very significant increase in rates of eating disorder since the onset of the COVID epidemic. Uh, and our colleagues in Australia and the UK have, have seen the same trends. Um, and most of our, our numbers started to go up um, probably a couple of months after the first lockdown last year. Uh, but the patients will report that their symptoms started during lockdown. And, that, and, and the, some of the uh, factors um, impacting that was the loss of their normal routine and a loss of their normal social contacts. Um, lots of anxiety, you know, everywhere in the media, there was, there's, um, and that, that hasn't changed yet, uh, increasing anxiety and distress about uh, COVID and the state of the world, uh, and their parents are anxious as well. Uh, they become, uh, a lot of the young people become much more introspective when they're spending time with themselves. And many people um, during the first lockdown, uh, we would often see young people coming in whose whole family decided to get healthy and start eating healthy and exercising as a family. Uh, and the rest of the family would um, do that for a while and then go back to their normal patterns. But the young person with an eating disorder would just carry on uh, becoming more and more focused on that. Uh, and the other thing, interestingly, before you came on, I was uh, talking to Katie about all these Zoom meetings. You spend such a lot of time looking at yourself on Zoom. Um, which is probably not particularly good if you've got if you're very sensitive as many teenagers are about body image and how how you look. Um, so before we get on to our cases, just a, a just a tiny little note of things to be aware of is that it's extraordinarily easy these days to buy any sorts of um, health foods, nutritional supplements, um, safe and natural cleansing. Uh, potions online. Um, teenagers can buy them. You can buy lots of them in the supermarket and health food shop. 
Uh, and lots of them are fine, but there are a few that are, can be quite uh, dangerous for young people with eating disorders. Uh, some young people drink lots and lots of licorice tea, which um, can help to, uh, it causes fluid retention, so it can make your weight seem higher than it is. Um, the one that we've had the most problem with is this one called Garcinia cambogia, which is quite widely advertised on social media as a sort of natural cleansing uh, formula. But uh, in young people who are undernourished who are also taking this, it can cause uh, liver and kidney dysfunction. Uh, so before we talk about a couple of brief cases, I just wanted to say that um, at the summer, summarize and saying just, just to remember that eating disorders can affect any anybody, any gender, any ethnicity, any body size. Um, weight or BMI on its own is less important than change over time. Uh, remember that children can become medically unstable much more quickly than adults. And um, impact, uh, a prolonged malnutrition can have a significant impact on long-term growth and development that you, you can't necessarily catch up on later. Um, having said that, the prognosis is generally uh, very good and early recognition and early intervention is the key. So I just had a couple of like very brief uh, cases. Um, uh, and if you've got any, um, and then we'll and then we'll open up for questions. Um, so the first one is a fifteen-year-old girl. Um, she uh, was trying to lose weight um, and develop secondary amenorrhea. Uh, her mother reported that she'd uh, been reducing her portion sizes, started to feel cold. She had her last period three months ago. She's quite lethargic and withdrawn still has uh, significant body image distortions, worried about being fat and wants to lose more weight. Uh, these are her weight, her, her um, growth parameters. So weight is between the 9th and 25th centile, height on the 50th, BMI between the 9th and the 25th. So below average, but not too bad. These are her OBS, so temperatures 35.4. Uh, lying heart rate 52, lying blood pressure 80, uh, doesn't have too much in the way of postural tachycardia, uh, and, but her, her standing blood pressure is a bit hard to, uh, to measure, not really sure, maybe 76 by palpation. So what would you do next? Oh, yep, admission, arrange bloods, bloods, ECG, yep, great. Great, uh, great answers. So she doesn't quite meet criteria for admission to Starship, which is sort of um, annoying. Well, not annoying, but um, you know, quite, quite tricky sometimes those borderline cases, um, but, but very close. So you would certainly want to do something. So um, if you're really concerned, you could send her to uh, somebody for an acute assessment, but uh, I, I think the bloods and an ECG is a great, really good idea. So these are her bloods. Um, so obviously the thing to um, note here is that her creatinine is elevated. So she's got some acute renal impairment. She looks like she's quite hemoconcentrated with a high hemoglobin and hematocrit, but her neutral count is low. Uh, her T3 is low, uh, but her T4 is not low yet. And interestingly, her estradiol is not particularly low either, um, which is a good thing. Uh, uh, and so if you look back further, this is her, so her weight was between the 9th and 25th centile, but she'd come from a, a very high weight. The, the, this young person lost about 30 kilos. Um, uh, and, and you do, a lot of young people in this situation um, get lots and lots of positive reinforcement when they start losing weight. Um, uh, and um, so that spurs them on to keep, to keep on going. And then it sort of often they lose control over their um, ability to, to stop losing weight. 
Um, so she, uh, you're quite, so she did end up coming into hospital and as soon as she had those bloods done, uh, it was apparent that she was pretty unwell. So she came into hospital and did very well. Uh, so the other case is a 13 year old boy. He was actually being seen by his GP for, for assessment of some warts. And while he was there, his parents mentioned that they'd been a bit worried about his eating and he'd lost uh, a little bit of weight over the last one to two months. So he'd lost about four kilos. So four kilos over two months doesn't sound too bad um, when you're thinking about adults uh, with, who are losing weight. Um, so they reported that he'd cut out almost all of his carbs and had become very obsessive about calorie counting. No issues at school, love school, very, very diligent student, no problems with his friends at school. Uh, but about uh, three months before, he, their family had been on holiday to Singapore. This was pre-COVID. Um, and he'd had some sort of choking episode, uh, episode while on a boat and was admitted to hospital briefly. Um, and after that, um, he, his parents really strongly encouraged him to eat a lot. I'm not sure whether it was something that the, they were told in the hospital in Singapore or not. But then he started uh, exercising a lot and he really wanted uh, to be tall and muscular, but didn't want to be fat. And he started refusing to eat with his family. Uh, when you looked at him, his weight was uh, very low. He's a very small uh, boy, quite short, uh, but very slight, with a BMI well below the 0 0.4 centile for his age. Um, once again, his heart rate was just above the threshold. His blood pressure was just above the threshold, but he felt a bit cool, and he's quite young and very small, so he was sent for bloods and an ECG, uh, but he didn't actually get them done. Uh, uh, they didn't get them done. Uh, it was seen again by the GP two weeks later, by which time he'd lost another, uh, over another further kilo and his heart rate was 39. So he came into the Starship. Uh, and this was his weight down here when he came into hospital. Um, and um, that was the weight at the GP, I think when they started treatment for the wart therapy. And then he has also, he's made a good recovery also. Um, so just before I finish and open it up to questions, I just wanted to say that a lot of you, um, I know a lot of you are being asked to uh, monitor patients Be because of the COVID um, surge and demand on eating disorder services. There is often quite a wait between patients being discharged from hospital and being picked up by outpatient therapy providers, um, either public or private. They've all got long waiting lists. Um, and so uh, GPs are increasingly being asked to do the medical monitoring um, while waiting for outpatient uh, treatment to start. Um, so usually that is in the form of a weekly review checking the weight, checking the obs, and checking the bloods. Um, and uh, I, ju I just wanted to check that whether anybody had any questions about that. Um, if, if there was any concern about progress during the wait waiting time, it would be the first point of contact would be the outpatient service, which is usually the uh, local CAM service. Um, uh, but but if you're really worried, if the child's refusing all food for more than 48 hours or their bloods are worryingly abnormal, um, then they should uh, be assessed for a, an, an urgent review. Uh, so my take home messages are um, just to remember eating disorders can affect anybody. Young people get medically unstable faster than adults. So remember to look at, at past weights and weight trends. Um, intervening early leads to much better outcomes. So even just raising it as a possibility with parents uh, really early on is sometimes all that's needed. Um, and that recovery from these uh, disorders takes time and close monitoring is uh, really important to identify uh, deterioration or relapse early. So open to questions, I'll hand over to Katie to 
to manage the questions. Thank you. That was a really excellent overview. And we do have a few questions coming in. So mm -hmm. um, how about dietary heights in relation to eating disorders? Are they at higher risk? So, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure I'd call veganism a hype, but I guess, you know, it is a focus. Yeah, they, they definitely are. And the, the fascinating thing about eating disorders and what causes them, which is a, 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 sorry, a slight tangent, but I will come back to that question. But um, the, about 50% of the cause of eating disorders is genetic. Um, so very often there's a family history, family history of eating disorder or related uh, disorders like anxiety. Um, but you can't, you always have to have a period of weight loss. So you, nobody develops an eating disorder without starting with losing weight. And, and it's thought to be some sort of epigenetic change, weight loss unmasks some underlying genetic tendency, and then the eating disorder takes, takes off. So any of the, any sort of diet or weight loss um, can be a trigger. Uh, so sometimes that's getting ready for the school ball, some are coming out or it can be the onset of an illness like celiac disease or, or some other illness that causes weight loss. Um, but it, a lot of families will notice that uh, young people will uh, increasingly cut more and more foods out of their diet. So they'll go low carb, they'll become vegetarian, they'll become vegan. Um, it's extremely hard to make a really good recovery when you have got an eating disorder on a vegan diet. We vegetarianism is fine, and you you can do it on a vegan diet, but it's, it has to be you have to eat vast quantities of food. And um, so, for the young people that come into hospital, we usually say um, if you weren't previously vegetarian before you developed your eating disorder, then we try and get them back to their previous diet. We're happy to manage vegetarian uh, diets, and we allow them three dislikes, so they you know. They can't say my three dislikes are carbs, dairy, and you know something or other else. But but if there are things that they've hated all their life, then we wouldn't make them eat it. Yeah. Great. And yeah. and I guess one of the themes that's sort of running through is is do you is there a helpline that people can contact for advice? Are there any particular resources available online in terms of food dietary management? Because as we know, there are often long waiting lists. Yeah, yeah. Manage the. I'm just going to join this one in together. How yeah, yeah. With these patients, yes, waiting for them to get that sort of next step. Yeah, yeah. There are. I mean, uh, you can find anything online. Uh, the place that we refer most people to is EDANS, um, the Eating Disorder Association of New Zealand. That are uh, that's run by parents, and they provide lots of amazing advice uh, and resources. They also um, have access to something called FEAST, which is a 30-day self-guided parent course uh, that provides lots of education about eating disorders. Um, and it's sort of parents talking to other parents, um, providing advice and support. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. And, and I guess in terms of how we support these patients, do, is there any particular... Um, food replacements that you would suggest, so that, such as Fortisip, or you wouldn't want to even go down that route, you know? Um, yeah, we, uh, I, food is the best, ideally, but we were quite often, we quite often use Fortisip in hospital, um, particularly um, uh, for people who just need that little bit extra. So we were quite often, when patients are going home, if they are managing on a meal plan and they want to start doing uh, netball again, we'll say, well, you know, if you're going to start reintroducing exercise gradually to your diet, you have to have a, a snack or a fortisip before you go. Uh, um, so, but we don't, ideally, we don't want people just uh, having fortisip. Um, for all sorts of complex social reasons as well as um, anything else. I mean, from a medical uh, biochemical point of view, it's perfectly fine. People can live on Fortisip forever, but um, it's not ideal. So, so we use it um, sometimes as a supplement if we can't get them to get there with food. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, 
you know, a lot of patients that have autism or ADHD and things like that yeah. be on medications that might impact on their appetites. Mm. Yeah. And how how do how do we sort of manage that? And are there any medications to help improve that appetite? Uh, we don't use medications to well, not not directly to improve appetite. Uh, ADHD is probably the commonest medication that impacts weight gain. Um, and that can be really tricky when you have patients with an eating disorder who also have significant ADHD. Um, so what we will often do in that situation is uh, if, they're, if they're in hospital and they're medically unstable, then we would stop their ADHD medication um, because you, you have, to, um, have to look after your physical health as a priority and then restart it when they are starting when they're making a recovery um, and usually that's not too tricky to sort out um, uh, the other thing uh, we don't use uh, appetite stimulant medication but we do uh, for some people who have extreme anxiety um, we will sometimes use um, uh, a lanzapine, antipsychotic medication at a very low dose, just an anxiolytic dose, and it happens to have a side effect of uh, promoting appetite, which all the young people Google and then say they're not going to take it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But that can be that can be really helpful with eating related anxiety. Yeah. Mm. Right. And yeah. quite a few people are asking about when would you do the bone X-ray on the hand and what's the sort of follow-up in terms of DEXA. So you do a bone scan and then how long would you, how long yep. after you repeat that? And, and yep. really that initial, that hand scan, when would you do that? Yeah, yeah. So um, for the hand X-ray, so the hand X-ray is looking uh, at um, whether you should be having your periods if your nutrition was good. Um, so we would do that um, on somebody who was, um, 13 or more um, and you th you think maybe they should have started their periods uh, and they haven't and um, you, and it's not completely clear whether it's due to undernutrition or it might be constitutional growth delay like sometimes the parents will say well I didn't start my period till I was 16 so that's what I'm thinking about her but if you're worried it's about the weight then you can get the hand x-ray for the bone age it's not it has quite a big margin of error about six months but usually if your bone age is 13 or more you should start your period sometime in the next six months if your nutrition is adequate um, as to the DEXA scans they're slightly harder to get you can get them done privately um, but there's two different reasons that we do a bone density scan one is obviously to look at the bone density that's probably the most important one um, and for most young people, it's, it's okay. Um, for people who are not sporty or have vitamin D deficiency or are extremely um, low weight, uh, it, it can be sometimes alarmingly low. Um, so, one, so one reason is to look at the bone density. The other reason is that if you can get a bone density scan, which I'm not sure if you can refer from primary care but to the university bone density scanner they can give you the body composition as well whereas the other scanners the, the private bone density scanners don't usually have that software package for young people they used to do it at the mercy but when they updated their software they decided not to do that which was a bit annoying um, but getting the, bow, the body composition is really useful for, particularly for athletes. So they might have the, oh, I've reached my goal weight, my BMI is on the 50th centile, I don't need to come to a clinic anymore, but they still haven't started their periods. And often it will be because their body fit's very low. Um, so if the bone density is very low and we want to uh, follow it up, so the vast majority are fine and you don't need to follow it up. If we do, we would usually repeat it in one to two years because um, the bones just don't change that much faster than that. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of initiating SSRIs for patients, do you, is that something that your team does? Do you get psychiatrists involved? Can this be initiated in the community before patients get to you if there is that long wait list? 
good question. There's not a long wait list to get to us because I, I work in the inpatient, um, the hospital part, so our doors are always open. Uh, that's not an invitation, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, but and we we work as a team, so we have psych, um, we have nurse specialists, psychiatrists, dietitian, school teachers, all working together. So they're all seen by a psych. Um, and uh, so sometimes we will start uh, those medications in hospital, but not straight away. Um, and and you have to be particular careful with SSRIs if you've got any electrolyte disturbance or ECG changes. So um, so we'll usually wait, um, you know, a, a week or two to see if improved nutrition is going to help their symptoms. Um, but it's usually pretty clear towards the end of the discharge if they are going to need something to help them with the transition home. Uh, it's quite interesting. A lot of these young, most of these young people do not want to come into hospital. They're, they're really unhappy about coming in. But then, within sort of a week or so, they sort of got used to the hospital routine and they're really worried about going home again. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, those times of change and transition can be tricky. Um, uh, so I guess if they're um, if they've been discharged from hospital without medication and uh, as you, as their primary caregiver, you're worried about increasing changes in mood. If their weight is stable and you feel confident, um, you could probably start them on something as long as you're happy. That um, I would start a very slow dose and go up very slowly, um, and you could probably you know chat to uh, you probably chat to some of the CANS team about what they think about that. Fluoxetine is probably the commonest thing we use for low mood and anxiety. Mm. And, and I guess you'd have to also be aware of the risk of the prolonged QT as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the psychological interventions that your service provides and things like that, what if you have people who are reticent, who don't want to engage, who don't think there's an issue, um, how does the CBT, DBT, or your psychological interventions? Mm, yeah, yeah, that, that's pretty tricky. I mean, by its very nature, eating disorders are, are things that patients don't want to get better from, and the treatment is the thing that they're trying to avoid, uh, which is what makes it so tricky. And it, it's every single meal, every single day, their parents having this ongoing battle with them. So, so it can be really tricky. Um, and that is why the, the therapy, the outpatient therapy works best if you've got a, a, a tight functional family unit. Um, even if it's separated parents who are working together well, uh, that can work really well as well. It's just consistent messaging. It's like, it's like um, managing toddlers. You've got to have the same message, be really consistent. Uh, that's not to be... Um, a derogatory about teenagers but you just just that consistency and there's that really easy tendency into one parent being the bad cop and one parent being the good cop and um so holding a lot the line all the time and a lot of family-based therapy is actually about supporting parents um to hold the line and cope with distress all sorts of things happen like their um their teenager who's previously a complete angel they've never had to get her to do anything before she's diligent she's sporty she's popular and suddenly she's you know throwing knives and um hitting her parents and swearing and it's, it's just really distressing to see um so how do you how do you manage the the people who don't want to come to treatment there's a there is a significant group who are quite tricky in the inpatient hospital setting if um if we're really worried about their physical health and think that their life may, them may be at risk, we can use the Mental Health Act. Uh, and we'll probably do that maybe 10 times a year, something like that. Uh, um, and the outpatient uh, domain, it's much harder because by definition, they're, they're not unwell enough to need hospital. Um, and there are some families who find it really hard to engage and some of them will, will will figure it out and slowly get better by themselves, but but a lot of them just don't have as good an outcome. It's it's really tricky. It's a constant discussion. Mm. So it's, mm. it sounds very tricky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds very very tricky. <laughs> yeah. 
In terms of, there was, there was a question earlier that you sort of touched on in terms of the particular effects on males. Yeah. Like, that, was, I, that was asked around the time that you were talking about fertility to females. So oh, yeah, yeah. Is there any impact on male f- fertility with even yeah, well, that's a really good question. I know I don't actually know about male fertility, but for the, uh, they certainly have low testosterone levels. Um, that tend to, because you, just like estrogen, you, you need a little bit of body fat to make your uh, uh, testosterone <coughs> and some of your sex hormone binding proteins as well. Um, so most of the males that we have who come in who are very underweight have low testosterone. Um, which worries them quite a bit when they're trying, particularly if they're trying to get muscly. Um, Wonderful. I just want to say thank you again for taking the time to present this evening and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Have a good night, everyone. Okay. See you.